Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 645th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have Sean Douglas. He spent a career in the military. He was a uh, crew chief uh, on various platforms, including the F-15, uh, and now he is a multiple-time uh, TEDx speaker. Uh, he gets paid to speak, he teaches people how to speak, uh, how to get paid for it. And um, so it was a cool story. You know, I love having veterans on um, and hearing their, you know, how they made the, um, the transition from active duty to entrepreneurship. And um, so this is a great episode uh, to hear what kind of success you can have uh, just being intentional. And that has lit a fire for me. I've had a few guys on like Grant Baldwin uh, talking about getting paid to speak. And uh, I remember my first paid uh, talk was in Vegas. It was, I got, I got retained in uh, middle of 2010, spoke in January, 2011. I think I talked about it in this episode, but, uh, you know, $6,000 and, uh, I've been paid, you know, to travel the world, been to Slovenia. I got to see my son in London on that trip. I was able to piggyback it. Um, and, uh, had Thanksgiving in, in London with my son <laughs> and then a trip to Slovenia. That was cool. But, um, I'm doubling down, um, targeting associations and groups and, and other events. So if you need a speaker, let me know. I can do it virtually. I can do it uh, in person. I can do regional training. Uh, I usually uh, will do a workshop at an event. So if I'm the keynote speaker, I'll stick around uh, and help with uh, kind of double down on the messaging um, in workshops. So, you know, if that is of interest, hit me up, okay? Go to the saleswhisper.com, hit the contact us, and, uh, and let's talk about it. Let's talk about your talk, shall we? Go do that, and then come back and listen to this episode with Sean. Sean Douglas. It's, it's always so nice to have an Air Force guy on, because, you know, I can use big words. I mean, you're not going to pick your nose on camera. You, right. you want crayons, you know? It's good, man. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? Hey, brother. Thank you for having me. I am doing amazing. And uh, yes, it is always good to have an intellectual conversation with somebody. I love picking on my veterans. Right? Oh, man. So uh, 20 years, 21 years? 20 years and four days. But who's counting, right? Right. Uh, and you were you were working on F-15s? I was. I was an F-15 crew chief, and then eventually I was a depot level on 16s, 8s, 10s, and 22s, and then became a a drill instructor, and then uh, went back to my career field. Did some security forces early on in my career, because I didn't really like the crew chief thing, so I did security forces for a little bit, and I was like, oh, screw this, and then went back to my career field, and then, um, yeah, it was was a great 20 years. 20 years and four days. And four days. Hey, man, we're very precise here at the Sales Whisperer, okay? Oh, we have to be very precise at the VA, too, because that's how you're going to get paid. Yeah. Well, yeah kind of those four days good. matter. Nice. So were you down at Lackland? As a drill instructor? Yeah. Yeah. So when I was at the Air Force Academy, one of the uh, options was to go down to Lackland. So yep. before, yeah, I think it was before my junior year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it was. Um but it because at the academy we have three three week stints. So one of the three weeks is summer vacation, but then the other two are training of some sorts. And so going to Lackland was an option, but it was a six week gig, right? And I grew up in Houston, so it was kind of like going home, you know. And I got it. Oh, it was awesome! But uh, holy hell, it was hot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've lived in Houston. I went to A&M for grad school. Uh, we moved back to Austin for years and my mom's in Bastrop and gosh, it was hot, but I got assigned to a female, um, squadron and, and there, there was this woman, Sergeant French. She was this itty bitty, teeny tiny little thing. A black woman with green contact lenses and a British accent, which I never figured out where the hell that came from. But she would chew these women up. Out, dude, I was, my back was against the wall. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. Yep. Was she, that 2009 or 10? Oh, no, no. This was 80. Oh, okay. 
90. She was wrecking them, man. And do not cross Sergeant French. <laughs> I still remember her to this day. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it was funny. How long were you there? As an I was director? from I was there from 09 to 2013. And while I was there, there was a small little black female, uh, Sergeant French. No way. Yeah. I wonder if she has a daughter. Oh, my gosh. I would love to look her up because I'm friends. So after after I went to A&M, I got sent to Korea. And I was, um, you know, when you graduate college, you don't know jack crap. Man. Right? So they assign you to a smart sergeant. <laughs> it's oh, like, wow. hey, keep the lieutenant out of trouble. Don't let him break anything. Right. Know? So uh, Sylvia Poole, I, we always had to put our initials on any of our briefings, right? So Sierra Victor Papa, um, uh, Sylvia Poole. So I found her on Facebook. So we're friends to this day. Nice. Uh, but I, I spent 90 days with her whatever shift because they would rotate whatever yeah. a few weeks or a month whatever you know day shift swing shift night shift so i i was at her side man for for 90 days but uh yeah she such a bridge she would wreck them man oh well <laughs> fun time That's awesome. i could tell some stories i'm sure you could too oh yeah uh, <laughs> so you do 20 years four days and now what you doing TEDx talks, you're teaching, teaching people how to, how to speak. Come on, man. You, you are, you're a wrench monkey. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's not, let's not, you know, sugarcoat this. Oh, but you're Air Force though. That's how you can speak that. That's, that's why. Okay. Yeah, man. It's that, all, it's that, all, that's where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how did you make that transition? That's a big transition. Yeah. Well, actually I built four businesses while serving in the military. Oh, nice. And I've I've always had like little side hustles. Uh, actually, I actually had some some pretty big businesses. There was an entertainment company that we were doing over half a million dollars a year. What? There was an antique store that we were doing about two fifty to three hundred k a year. But the but the speaking came in two thousand sixteen. After a, being a drill instructor, I transitioned back to basically my job and. At the new base at Seymour Johnson, they said, hey, we're starting this resilience program, and we need some instructors. I said, well, I was an instructor. I just came from there. Well, after my deployment in 2013, I came back in 2014, and they said, okay, we're going to send you to instructor school. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And they're like, no, we're, we're going to send you to a two-week course. And I was like, you, you do realize I, I literally just got back from basic training, and they're like, oh. Okay, well, let's just send you through the master trainer course. I'm like, sure. Well, there was two other drill instructors in there, and we were just laughing. I was like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, you should just look at our resume. I mean, we're trying to be cocky, but it was like, just let us do our thing. Like, literally just let us teach. Yeah. So they were like, here's how you do it, and here's how you deliver the material. And we're just sitting there like, you got to be kidding me. So then we get up there, and we do our thing, and the instructors are like, are you are you prior instructors? Like, yeah, we're we're, we're drill instructors. And they're like, oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> I was like, oh my god. So I spent two weeks at Dover, and we went through this resilience training course. You know, well, we went down to UPenn to get trained on their resilience program, then brought it back to the Air Force and blued it, and that was our resilience course that we had taught from 2014 ongoing it's still a version taught today but the military has stripped basically everything out of it and made it whatever they want it to be right now but we were teaching UPenn's resilience program from 2014 to 2009 so what the heck is a resilience program so the resilience program was basically the calf was what they was what they created comprehensive airman fitness and it went along the along, along the lines of the new regime or the new way of thinking was whole airman concept so we taught mental physical social spiritual resilience principles we then a couple of years later said well they're not really nutritionists and nutritionists on base were getting mad that we were teaching this class about nutrition, about health or whatever, they got mad. So we deleted the physical resilience out of our course and decided that, okay, we're going to do mental, spiritual, emotional, and social resilience. And basically 
the CAF program became what you would call like we're having a duty, a down day. Everybody's going to teach one pillar of this, whatever resilience. We're going to have a suicide awareness class and all the stuff. So it was the uh, basically the MRT was the master resilience trainers on base that would go around to all the different units and teach one class to like all of their people. Uh, yeah. I remember having total quality management TQM training. I actually uh. here at March Air Force Base in 94, 95. And, you know, I'm 24 years old. And I'm just rolling my eyes at this thing because it's, it's all from the top down. It's like, yeah, if, if the boss man ain't for it, this ain't happening, but okay, right. let's, let's all go through this training. But oh well, you got some good training and it laid the foundation, right? So, yeah. hey, cool. So, um, so walk me through that, right? So you're, this is 2016, and you were gonna, you were retiring when? 2020, 2021, 21. 21. Uh, did the whole COVID crazy crap uh, give you second thoughts about getting out? No, not at all. I never had second thoughts. In 2016. I was doing the resilience training and I got I got booked. Somebody found me through my social media and said, Hey, we'd like to have you come speak. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. So I was already doing that as a drill instructor. High schools and colleges would have me come speak and have them come train their their junior ROTC and their ROTC program because I was now, always a judge. Did you do it you had to do it for free? Yeah. 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 Okay. And because I was a judge at national drill competitions, they're like, hey, would you want to come to our school? I'm like, ah, sure, you know, whatever. And they said, you know, we can't pay you. You I'm like, "Ah, I get it, I get it, I get it. But in 2016, I got paid like $1,000 to go speak at this conference about finding your purpose and um, resilience and all the stuff. And I'm like, huh. I can make a business out of this. How how did you get found? Did you have your own website? Yeah, it was just on Facebook. Oh, they just okay. found me on Facebook through my post because I was posting some of our content from the course. Oh, nice. And I said, okay, I'm gonna write my I'm gonna write a book because that's what everybody I ever researched online was like, you have to have a book. If you're a speaker, you have to have a book. So okay, I guess I'll write a book. So then I self published a book called Decisions: The Power to Overcome Self Defeating Behaviors and. That led to 2017, creating my first radio show, Life Transformation Radio, which I sold in 20 had 436 or 476 episodes, and sold that. But that show led me to become an icon of influence. I was at a I was at a summit called New Media Summit, and they crowned me an icon of influence. I was speaking everywhere, and then I said, "Okay, in 2017, I really want to get a TEDx talk." That's the Super Bowl of speaking, and I'll do it in five years because I'll be retiring in five years. I'll give me five years to kind of solidify myself as a speaker. I did it that year. I said I would do it in five. I did it that year in December of 2017. Got my first of three TEDx talks. All right. To be fair, a TEDx. I've given a TEDx. A TEDx is like. Uh, it's it's like an NCAA championship, the, a, full, <laughs> okay. a full TED talk. I would call the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah, but I don't have I don't want to pay ten grand to speak on their stage. Oh yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, no. <laughs> I thought they picked just good people. No, they're no. Are they all paying. No, I thought the same thing too until I looked into it. And literally, you pay ten grand to speak on their stage. Oh yeah, kiss my grits. All right, that's cool. So, so how did that happen? How did that first one happen? Yeah, I got nominated by a nonprofit that I was doing some work with. Did, did and you ask them to nominate you? No, no. Nice. No. And so two of us from that nonprofit uh, got booked to speak at that event. And I was the opening speaker and he was the closing speaker. It was super cool. Nice. Yeah. And then during the pandemic in 20, I did it online because- Events got shut down. Like, oh, we'll just do it online, and right. literally, no one has has seen it. <laughs> you know, it's just another, you know, talk or whatever, like virtual talk, you know, like Zoom or whatever. And then I your resume three x well x speaker. I can say that, yeah. And yeah. then last year in twenty in March, in my home state of Michigan, 
I delivered my third TEDx talk at Lake Superior State University on the answer to veteran suicide and why identity matters. And that was nice. my talk was how to stop veteran suicide because when we exit the military, we lose our identity. Yeah. And we need to fill that void with something. And so that was the whole reason why I built businesses in the military so that I would have something to do on the outside. Right. And then like, did you have to get permission or anything from the military nope. to have any side income? No, as long as you made under a certain amount of money. When you were doing half a million dollars, I mean, I, I was gross revenue, but um, I mean, that, that didn't put you over a threshold? No, the threshold's a million. So you have to earn a million or, yeah. or yes. gross a million? You have to gross a million. Okay. Or win a million in Vegas. Win a million or take home a million. <laughs> right? And the government takes a big old chunk of Vegas. Yeah, they money. do. <laughs> we were actually uh, TDY to Vegas. And one of the pilots had won the jackpot of a million dollars. And of course, the military found out and they're like, you, you have you have to give some money away. They're like, well, I'm the pilot, you know, with all the taxes and everything, like, we'll just, we're just making sure you know that you cannot possess over $1 million worth of, worth of assets or cash or whatever. Otherwise, you'll have to exit the military. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole regulation on this. Wait, 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 what? What? Like at one time? I mean, what? Yeah. What if you get an inheritance? You can't serve and have over a million dollars worth of assets. You can't be worth, you, you cannot have a net worth of over a million dollars. No kidding. Yeah. According Has to it always been a thing? I, I guess it was in an Air Force regulation. I mean, I didn't come from money, so that, <laughs> right. that was never a risk. So I never had to read that chapter. So. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, just with the run-up of houses, right? If If a guy is stationed here... And they've owned a home for 10 years. They could easily be worth a million dollars. I mean. So there's got to be some gardens yeah. in there or something. Something. Yeah. But that's that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the first one I don't want to talk about because you, in a way, it was luck. But you you were putting yourself out there and, and you were sure. visible. So that's that's fine. You know, so everyone listening, be visible, right? Be seen. Be known. Yep. Um, but so let's say your last one, did, did you, did you ask for any of these? Cause I'm, I'm trying to pull out, uh, actions that our listeners, they can, is there a model? Is there an yep. outline that yep. you could direct people towards say, you know, go do this to stack the odds in your favor 100%. to reach these goals? Yeah. hundred percent. The okay. third one was the second and third one was all me and, and how you apply to the talk what you say in your proposal. So the first thing you have to do, if you want to get on TEDx, this is what you do. And this is what I teach people to do. You have to start out with a startling fact, a startling story, or a startling discovery. Because you have to hook them. They get hundreds of pitches to get booked at these events. Yeah, You have to hook them in the first 10 seconds, 15 seconds max, you have to hook them. And whatever you want to talk about has to match the theme of the event or you have zero chance. So if the theme is a bright future and you want to talk about like AI, cool, AI is the future. But if you want to talk about real estate, and how people can invest in real estate for a bright future, you might have a chance. But if your real estate talk is like, this is what I did to become a millionaire and you can too, like they're not going to care. Yeah. You know, it, it, it has to link up with the theme of the event. Sure. And then the third part, and which is most important, is what is that big idea? And how has humanity changed if you implement that big idea? So you mm -hmm. have to have that fact or story, something that's big, something that's like, hey, one, one person I was working with, they said, 100% of you at some point in this room, at some point in your life, will die. I was like, okay. And it grabbed him, man. It hooked him. Another lady I was working with, 
her opening line was, I used to eat out of trash cans. But before I tell you that story, I just want to tell you this. And the crowd was like, whoa, hold on. What? You know, and and it, they were hooked. They were like, what do you mean you used to eat out of trash cans? Like, what are you talking about? So you have to, it, there's got to be some kind of a, a hook. You know, and then midway through the talk, she goes, remember when I told you I used to eat out of trash cans? Here's the story. And everybody's like, oh, okay, finally, here we go. Yeah. So they were looking forward to that. Yeah. I just laid out the statistics for suicide for veterans. And I laid out the statistics of, I mean, this is all research studies. I mean, this is everything's, you know, it's out there. And so I laid that out and I tied in how when you leave the military, you lose your identity. And that has a lot to do with why there's veteran homelessness, veteran suicide. And they were like, yep, loved it. Nice. And that was it. And then combined with the research studies and the data that I provided and that big idea, they're like, this is a winning, winning you know, proposal. So that's what, I, that's what I help a lot of people do is create that winning proposal using those three items because that's exactly what they're looking for. And so what is the benefit of giving a TEDx talk? Is it just, just credibility? credibility? For you, you know, I see it on your LinkedIn profile, on your website. Does that just help smooth the path like for paid speaking gigs and, and consulting and things like that? Yes, yes, absolutely. And people who have spoken at TEDx have gone on to do incredible, incredible work, but they got their start there and they got known there because that platform reaches millions and millions of people. When your talk is on the TED YouTube or on the TED site, millions of people are going to see it. Yeah. And all it takes is somebody finding your talk and then playing it in a college class. And we should have him come speak here. And, and it's just, that's how it works. Yeah. But just getting on that stage is, is hard enough. But then getting discovered, like my first TEDx talk has, I don't know, 18 or 20,000 views or something like that. And I think my new one, I think that one's, they didn't really, they didn't really promote it, you know, all that much. So they usually leave it up to the speakers to promote that. You know, I, I think, I think it's a few hundred, but out of those few hundred, you know, I, I've gone on, like I was in Texas last year in Midland, Texas, delivering a Veterans Day speech because someone saw my TEDx talk. Yeah. And that was a paid gig. That was a that was a $3,500 paid gig. Nice. Very cool. So h- how do you split your time now between, you know, doing your own thing, speaking and whatnot, or teaching others, coaching, like how, what's, what's the makeup or the breakdown of, of your business now? Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple clients that I'm working with to get them on TEDx, uh, to launch podcasts too. We launch, we launch podcasts and whatnot. So, uh, we used to do a lot of books, but that became very labor intensive. So I have another, I have another team that, that, that deals with that. But, uh, yeah, I got a couple clients that I'm working with quite a, quite a few clients that, that I work with, with their podcasts, getting them booked on stages and podcasts, um, TEDx. So, that and then I speak probably, I would say twenty twenty five times a year. You know, I'm speaking. There's a actually there's a uh, online summit going on right now that was pre recorded, and then uh, I'll be I think in a couple of days I'll be, you know, speaking, but it's pre recorded. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of virtual summits that that I do. I just spoke at one last week called the National Publicity Summit. I just did that one. Then there's this one. Uh, there's another one coming up in like two weeks that was already pre-recorded. It's a lot of virtual summit. But as far as like in-person speaking, you know, there's probably two events maybe every month. You know, that's live in person, mm-hmm. and uh, and that just goes with my schedule. So out of those twenty or twenty-five, uh, like what percentage are paid talks? First, like a summit, I've been invited to a lot of those, and yep. I'm torn on them. I mean, some of these people get freaking pushy. 
Oh yeah. Or, you know, you're going to oh, come yeah. on, but you're going to, you know, you're going to send forth emails to your list, yeah. to, you know, tag yeah. us on four. So yeah. all in all, I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah. I got time for it. You know? So it's like, I'm just yeah. building their list and, and I've, Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten mediocre results from it. So it's like, I'm not chomping at the bit for those. Right. Uh, but, but I mean, it can't social be, presence and social, social presence. You can, I have gotten leads in business. So, you know, choose them carefully and they can be good. Yeah. You know, but, um, I'd say three quarters of mine are paid. Three quarters of my speaking's paid. Yeah. Good. So I, I traditional, like, yep. go to a conference, step on yep. stage, like our keynote sort of thing. Absolutely. Do you also, do you do this and or recommend like teaching like a, some type of workshop or something along with it, you know, to augment the talk? Like what's your, what's your feelings on that? Yeah, I actually worked for a professional seminar company a couple of years ago. And when I wasn't speaking, they would book me in different places and that pay isn't great. It's like $600 a day and you're gone for three days, you know, teaching a half day workshop. But I mean, everything's paid for though. The flight's paid, hotel's paid, your Uber's, you know, food or whatever. Like it's all reimbursed. Plus yeah. they give you like a per diem. So it's like being TDY. And then, you know, you're taking home 600 bucks a day for delivering yeah. a half day workshop, you know, to a government agency of some kind. Yep. Yeah. You know, so, so that, that part was, but yeah, I was approached by one. I've got, <laughs> I've got a stack of books, about right. maybe that big up on my shelf, uh, on like social media marketing, web copy. Uh, it, so it was a little bit of bait and switch, but I think it was like a seminar type company and. So I ended up buying all these books because they shipped them to me. Then I realized what was going on because it was something like that. And yeah. I was just, I was just going to deliver their content. Um, and, and after looking at it, they, there were some clauses and whatnot. I was like, I was not comfortable with it. And so right. I stopped it and boy, they were mad. Woo. But, uh, but yeah, it can be good money. And, and the, it's stress free in that regard yep. because everything's done, right? You just got to show up and deliver. Um, and so, you know, are you still with them? No. Okay. Like a little transition sort of thing for you back. It was yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. But you also get experience, right? And you and you get contacts. I mean, I'm still in touch with people. I, I did a 10 month gig with Dell in two. Wow. And I still have contacts from them. So, you know, that's awesome. Meeting people, putting your face out there, and getting the reps in is always a good thing. Yep. It will pay off. Uh, so, you know, kudos to you for jumping in and you know knocking it out. I mean, t take what's there, and then y you'll figure out the next thing, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, want, yeah. If you want to earn more than 600 bucks a day, you, you'll figure out the next thing. But in the meantime, you're putting food on the table. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so. Yep. And cool. if you do that twice, right? You do that. You do that twice a month. You know that's three day gigs. You know I mean, it's thirty six hundred bucks. And combined yeah. with my military retirement and VA disability, you know it's not a it's not a bad gig. Yeah, I mean that's what forty forty two forty five grand working six days eh, plus travel. So call it yeah. eight day eight days away from home. Yep. Yeah. All yep. right. There's worse worse ways to make a buck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, what did you learn from that though? Were you able to pull some some nuggets, some structure? Yeah. You know, do's or don'ts from that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There was so much forwarding ahead if you're gonna bring books or if you're gonna yeah, bring yeah, yeah. manuals, right? Like FedEx it ahead of time. Don't bring it on the airplane. True. You have you know, a way of connecting with people. Like, how do I network? How do I turn this gig into the next gig? And so, I mean, it was a lot of networking. There was a lot of, a lot of you know, shaking hands and and really like the behind the scenes is what nobody sees. All they see is you on stage. Like, oh, he's so awesome. He's on stage. But they don't see that you're out at a networking event after that event, getting to know a bunch of people that even put on the conference or, you know, you're at dinner with the conference organizer. Like, who do you know? You know, where should I be speaking? You know, stuff like, I mean, you're just, 
you're having a conversation with them, like, how can I benefit you outside of this event? I don't want to just come here and speak and leave. You know, I'd, I'd love to build a relationship. How can we do that? And so you're literally networking and negotiating behind the scenes. Right. And no one's ever going to see that. Right. And, yeah, and I, that's important. You know, do you ever see Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Oh, yeah. You know, ABC always be closing. And I'm like, I came up with the new ABCs, right? And one of them is always be curious. Yep. You know, you're there. Show up early. Stay late. Yep. Ask some questions. You know, because people want to help, right? You show up. You do it. They want to help. They want to spread the word. <sighs> yep. You know, you can't be aloof. You can't can't be drunk. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Show up early. Yeah. Learn something about them ahead of time. Learn a little bit more while you're there. And, and man, they'll roll the red carpet out for you. Oh, absolutely. Then you get a video testimonial. Then the video testimonial goes on your website. And like, oh. man, it's just amazing. Dude, I, I bust out the iPhone. But there I go, hey, can you say that again? Yep. Can you, you tell me how ask. awesome I am one more time? Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's funny, right? Because you, you let them... I learned this, right? You let them give you a compliment, right? So if, if it comes out, right? So, oh, we love you. So I just let them. Basically, they're getting a, a, a dress rehearsal in. Yeah. And I'm like, would you mind saying that one more time on camera? Because oh, a lot right. of times people, they get nervous, you know, when they see the red light go on. I'm like, just, yeah. and I will hold their hand, even men. And yep. I'm like, they're cool with it. And it calms them down. And they, they give whatever, 20-second, one-minute testimonial. Yeah. And it's just this beautiful thing. But people are so jaded, I make them say my name. Yes. Wes, thank you for coming here. Thank, because people will, they will think it's a fake testimony and you just swiped it off the internet. So, I mean, yeah, how jaded yeah, we like, are as a species. Oh, we had Sean speak here at this event and it was so good. And like, yep. all, oh, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, how do you know how to price a keynote talk? Well, there's an industry standard. You know, if you're beginning, it's between one and 3000. If you're intermediate, it's between three and five or maybe four to seven. If you're a celebrity, it's over 10 grand, you know, but one major key aspect that I learned in that professional seminar company is that you're only as valuable as someone is willing to pay. And another thing, inside of speaking, you will only get paid per the value that someone sees inside of themselves. And that goes for coaching too. When you try to get coaching clients, if they don't think that they're valuable enough, they will not pay your price. Yeah. So they will only pay according to the value that they see in themselves. And with the organizers, they're only going to pay what they think your keynote is worth. And most associations pay between 2,500 and 3,500. So you could, like I literally emailed almost every single association in the state that I was living. I used to live in North Carolina and I emailed almost every single association in the state of North Carolina. I said, Hey, I'm a speaker. I saw that you have a couple conferences that you do. If ever you need a speaker, here's what I talk about. Would love to have a conversation with you. Would love to get on the book somehow, you know, whatever. And that landed me, you know, just under probably 10 gigs. But then yeah. that led to me and, going to Georgia and to what, speak at an association conference. So in what time frame? So how, like how, how many, how many did you contact over what time frame? Like in, in a month? Did it take you three Oh yeah, months? to be, to be probably like, probably, probably to be like a week or two. Okay. And it was, a, it was quite a few hundred. And I'd, say about, you, I'd say about it, let's call it, let's call it about 100, 150, whatever. And so you sent just a personal email to each? I did. To the event, to the um, executive director and the association president. Nice. Okay. And then and, out of that, it's probably, probably half got, got a hold of me. You know, hey, received your email. Hey, appreciate you. Yeah, if we ever need a speaker, like, we'll let you know, you know. And then out of the half, I would say maybe a quarter or an eighth. You know, maybe like 30 of them, maybe 20, you know, really wanted to have a, a forwarding conversation with me. And then I probably got booked on like maybe seven or eight stages. And That's kind of how it works. It's a numbers game. And so in what, in what time frame were the, were the talks? It's like all within the same year or half year? Yeah, 2018 and 2019. Okay. 
2017 was 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 pretty pretty okay. That was a lot of conferences. I spoke at the Jim Moran Institute at Florida State University. They have uh, an entrepreneur event that goes on there every year. I spoke there. But 2018, 2019, that was, I mean, that was it. Prospecting, associations. I was speaking at a lot of different marketing conferences. People were finding me online. You know, there was a lot. There was a, I was speaking a lot. Yeah, good. Um, so, so seven, eight stages, let's say, let's say three grand, right? You know, as an average. So 24 grand. Could you sell anything there? No. You know, or do they kind of frown on that? Yeah, no, you can't. You can't sell anything. No, you can. I, they won't even give you like a table talk because I've spoken to an association, and you know, they, they let me sell my own book uh, in the back of the room. But yeah, no, no big overt pitches. Yeah, well, so inside of my talk, the way I end it for associations because associations comprise a lot of different businesses and a lot of different decision makers. Sure. So I say, you know, if this talk resonated with you, I'd love to have a conversation about how I can bring it to your work center, you know, all that other stuff. And that got the ball rolling into a company paying me five or ten, twelve thousand dollars to come into their company and do a half day workshop for their C suite or for their leadership team or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So that's why associations are really good because you have such a such a community of 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 businesses and decision makers at one location that you speak at that association event and they love you. I spoke at a, in Georgia, I spoke at the school, the book, the school bookkeeping association. And a couple of them said, we need to bring you to our high school just to speak at an assembly. I'm like, let's do it. And then the high school paid me like two grand. Uh, so. Nice. Yeah. Keep on pushing. Huh? Yeah. That's cool. Uh, and that's the way that it is, right? People think, oh, I got to have this all mapped out. And it's like, I tell them it's like walking through the woods at night with a flashlight. Yeah. You know, you you know where you are, okay? You, you know, uh, this is not the Amazon. You don't have thousands of miles to walk. You didn't, you know, drop out of an airplane, you know, eject from an airplane. Right. Um, it's, it's. The backyard forest, you, you know its extent. Okay, it's dark. Maybe it's even rainy, but you got a flashlight. So as long as the next step you take is solid and you know roughly east, west, north, south. Yeah. It's like keep stepping. You know, things are going to open up. And you know, that was one of the hardest things for me to learn as an entrepreneur along the same lines, but it's sell it first and build it. You know, like if I'm yep. going to have a course, you know, on copywriting, I I know how to write. I, I know how to teach. So, but I'm not going to make, you know, 200 slides and an 80 page workbook. If I don't have any customers, All right? you know, so I, I'll pre-sell it. And and tell them, hey, this is my first time teaching this class. I want to see if there's an interest. You know, this would be a thousand dollar class. I'm thinking of doing it. You know, for a hundred bucks. Uh, you know, if I can get ten people at a hundred bucks, I'll do this class. Oh, okay. Oh, I get twenty. All right, fine. I'll cut it off at twenty. You know, say, hey, we're gonna start. We're gonna do it in thirty days. Okay. So now I have, now I have, two grand, three grand, whatever. Uh, you know, and some interest. Okay. Now, I'll, now I don't have to teach to a a blank room, empty room. Right. And now I'm motivated to create the content. Then it's recorded. Then I'll, I'll push it out there. So, you know, the same thing with speaking, make the calls, contact the associations, contact the high schools, contact the rotary club, whatever, you know, start flapping your gums, get some experience. Yeah. It's, it's harder than it looks, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. People are like, Oh yeah, well I'll just, I'll just have this book or this course or this one thing. And then, you know, my inbox is going to be flooded in my email. Like they're just going to email me to have me come come speak or whatever. Like you realize, there's millions of speakers out there. I mean, there's got to be millions of speakers. Well, and, there's millions of wannabe speakers, right? <laughs> right. Who are who are getting booked over you because they're the ones calling. Like right now, people should be calling colleges and say, "Hey, do you have a graduation commencement speaker? Are you in the market for a graduation speaker?" 
Well, they're late with that, don't you think? I mean, well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's been they, two months. It, they should they should probably have it figured out. You know, in January they should probably be calling. You know, hey, you know, let's talk to you about your graduation speaker and all that. You know, yeah. yeah. Colleges typically book you know two to three months because like, they want to know that you know everything's going to be you know good to go. So yeah, I would say about about ninety. 90 days, 90 days out, you should be pitching people, you know, for whatever is going to happen. You know, yeah. Veterans Day, I should be at least minimum 90 days out contacting veterans organizations and in, in different places to have me come deliver a Veterans Day speech or a Memorial Day speech or a Fourth yeah. of July speech or, you know, whatever. How do you decide when to give a free talk versus paid? Because I mean, uh, are the veterans, you know, Veterans Day, is the city going to pay you to come give that talk or are you going to do it for exposure? So that's the that's the that's the crux of it all, because if I'm speaking to like a nonprofit, like a veterans group, you know, I want to give back. But I'm not going to spend three grand on plane tickets and hotels and everything else to come speak for free. Like I'm just I'll do something locally. But like last year, I went to Midland, Texas. And the Rotary Club there, somebody heard me speak at an event in whatever town's next to Midland. I can't remember. It starts with an O. But uh, Odessa. Odessa, yeah. So I was in Odessa and I was speaking at an entrepreneur event. And somebody was in my breakout room and they said, oh, my gosh, I have a friend that is part of the Rotary Club. And they're putting on a Veterans Day event and they're looking for a speaker. I'm like, let's go. And so they got me in touch with that person. I was referred to them. We had a great conversation. They're like, we'd love for you to come down. Here's 3,000. So, but, um, that, but that Odessa, Texas event, that was free. That was a free event. And I went down there because I knew that being at that entrepreneur event and city officials being there and the people that were, that were attending that event we're going to be very lucrative. And it, it, it turns out that it's still paying dividends. Yeah. And so they've already reached out and said, hey, we'd love for you to be the keynote speaker of this year's event. I'm like, let's go. Let's do it. Yeah, and I think, too, once once you start getting out there, you know, you're probably you're probably going to undercharge at first. You're probably going to sure. get a few pigs. You're going to end up at some 4-H club thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Wrong audience, wrong event, but you're going to learn, you know, so but get out there and do it. Uh, you And you'll learn, you know, once you get punched in the nose a few times, you're like, I got to charge more. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You'll figure it out. But uh, nothing beats doing. doing. Like, like Mike Tyson, right? everybody has a plan. They get punched in the face. Oh, yeah. So make the calls. And would you recommend somebody start like that? Like, like try call local. Yep. You know, call regional. Yeah. Uh, so the best way to do it is to speak nationally, but sleep locally. Meaning search for a call for speakers for a national conference in your area. You just search for them. I mean, they're, they're, they're everywhere. You could be call for speakers, national conference, Utah, and see what association conferences that are national conferences because every national conference brings representatives from every region and every local and state chapter. All right. So if you're speaking at a national, like I was in North Carolina and I spoke at the School Nutrition Association. And that was in South Carolina. Somebody from Virginia was there, brought me in to speak to their local group in Virginia and paid me a thousand dollars to do it. Mm -hmm. And so not only did I get, you know, 3,500 from that association, but then they said, Hey, you know, would you want to come speak to our group locally? We can pay you a thousand dollars. I'm like, sure. And I was in North Carolina. So I drove like two hours North to Virginia. And when I spoke at that conference, I drove three hours South to South Carolina, to Myrtle beach. And I got paid, and then I brought my kids and my family with me, and we just hung out at Myrtle Beach for two days. So it was like a mini vacation, but at the same time, I got paid. You know, I mean, most people live on about five thousand dollars a month. 
Yeah. So if I do two speaking gigs at three thousand, that's six thousand. Like that's pretty much my monthly expenses. Yep. You know, I'm not trying to get you know fifty thousand dollars a month, which would be beautiful, but you got to start somewhere, and yeah. you know it's good enough. You know, and now you know I'm I'm booked all the time at fifty five hundred, all the time. Right. So I had to do those little ones in order to get the big ones. So you say do a search for call for speakers. Is it as simple as go to Google, type in call for speakers and start in quotes. seeing what's up? It has to be in quotes. Okay. Because I'm doing in- that now and there's great results just without quotes. Now here's, here's a quote. So mic drop workshop, Empire State Society of Association. Oh executives. yeah. And so that association right there, the one, the Empire State. So that right there is, is a, is a national conference for associations. Okay. You can speak there and speak to tons of associ- of national associations. So, and you put in call for speakers, you put in your topic. So like in quotes, call for speakers, then put your topic, resilience, sales, whatever. And then there's a whole bunch of, uh, of places that are looking for speakers. Or if you want to get into corporate, you could in quotes, put in request for proposals. So you type in in quotes, request for proposals, see what pops up. Maybe it's not popping up the way you think it will, or maybe there's a company that's like, hey, we're looking for a resilience trainer, blah, blah, blah. Or you put in request for proposals and then end quote, you can put in your topic, resilience, sales, marketing, leadership, you know, whatever. And then that's going to narrow it down to the places that are literally looking for speakers. On social media, you go to Facebook, type in hashtag call for speakers, LinkedIn, hashtag call for speakers. And then that's going to unlock all kinds of events. Hey, we're looking for a speaker. We're looking for a speaker. Hey, we're looking for a speaker. We're looking for a speaker. And so you do this for two 19, hours a day. There's 19,000 posts on Facebook with the hashtag call for speakers. There you go. <laughs> so there might be a couple of free ones mixed in. There might be, but here's what I do. So when I see an event, I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like I could speak it. We're looking for a leadership speaker. First thing I do is friend request the organizer, then like the post, then comment on the post, then click the link and look at their, look at their application or, or however they're going to book you or whatever. And then if I fill out the application, I go back to that, to that person, send them a message personally. Hey, just want to let you know, I saw this. I applied. Let me know if you need anything else. Then go back to the post and hit and, and just type in applied. So, I mean, you're all over that that algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, you got to stand out because I do, uh, I have a job search, a couple of job searches on LinkedIn. Yep, I do too. For, for like CMO, CRO, uh, VP of marketing. Uh, copy freelance copywriter, and so yep. I'll see gigs, you know, and they're usually for a full time employment. But then I'll yeah. message them. Uh, I, I saw one today, freelance copywriter. It was something like six hundred applicants. Yeah, you yeah. know, in like <laughs> days or a week. I don't know. It was overwhelming. But yeah, I just I look up the company. I I go friend a couple of people because I'm looking for change. Right where. Yep where there's some kind of turmoil or whatever. And then I'll just reach out. Do you hire contractors? Does this have to be full time, you know, on and on. And I land gigs. Yep. You know, it's just, you don't have to follow the rules. You could do the same thing on Indeed. Yeah. You don't have to follow the rules. <laughs> right. So, and honestly, if you do, you're going to get stuck. You'll never, you'll never stand out because it, they're flooded. And oh, yeah. AI and overseas VAs. I mean, things are just, you know, I'm, I'm working with a tech company right now and I'm creating real email messages and I'm telling him, make some phone calls, leave a voicemail. Hey, I just shot you an email. Yeah. And then we're sending direct mail, a letter. Uh, we use a tool a friend of mine used to work at called Sendoso. Mm-hmm. So it can, you can put in a budget per, per contact and, send whatever, a book, a box of chocolates, you know, something. But it, it makes them validate their address because a lot of people work from home. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you can't, you're not just going to send an email and just, oh, you're exactly what we've been looking I for. Know. We were hoping you would email us. Out of these thousands we were, of applicants, we were praying. waiting for yours. 
thank yep. you so much for this great email. So, yeah, all right, yeah, very true, very cool. So your website. So my wife just texted me. We have to go play pickleball, and we're uh, we're at an hour already. Like, we discovered pickleball, our county. So I'm the HOA president, going on my third year, man. You know, because wow. we're we're Air Force. I mean, you yeah. know, people, people come to us for leadership, but our county has funds. We got a two court pickleball court installed for free for our little community. Wow. So, and now, and my father in law lives a mile away in his 55 plus community. So he he brought us to his place uh, just two weeks ago. It was on a Sunday, Sunday night. Place was empty. It's like individual individual courts, benches, chairs. They have a they have staff that works at the clubhouse. So wow. 10 p.m. right on a Sunday night. She's like, I'll bring y'all some water. Like this beautiful facility, man. Swimming pool, tennis courts, bocce ball, yeah. uh, two two pickleball, and the place we had it to ourselves. Like, okay, oh, we're wow. coming back here, Papa. Right. Uh, oh my gosh. So that's awesome, but uh, like the whole family has gotten addicted now to uh, to pickleball. So uh, it's been fun. I've been watching some videos. It's I mean, like if you've played tennis, racquetball, you, you understand the mechanics, right? But it is yeah, you know, you're hitting this wiffle ball, right? So it it moves different, and uh, yep. and there's the rules with the kitchen and all this stuff. Oh yeah, but like I literally never played it till like three weeks ago. They have tournaments and everything. It's a huge, oh, it's a huge sport. Yeah, huge. I had no idea. Huge. I, I guess so. This so where I live is it's called Murrieta and Temecula. So it's like Tampa, St. Pete, right? But, yep. But I mean, we're we literally just butt up to each other. So there's no water separating us. So there's you know quarter million people here, and so Temecula, more people know, but the two towns are about the same age, about the same size. But Temecula is better known. But I guess they installed seventeen courts. At, at one park. Good lord! It's like holy smoke! I had no idea it was that big, but I, I've now learned it's very big. It's very. So big. I gotta go play pickleball, but uh, but your website is the Success Corps. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I would pick on our Marine Corps buddies, but they know how to spell corpse right. with no <laughs> with no e. Uh, Navy, but Navy may struggle. So C O R P S yeah. the Success Corps dot com. Uh, and you've got a very affordable download there right on the homepage, get book to speak, right? So what is, what does that entail? Yeah, it is my that? exact business model laid out in a 50, a 12 page, 12 or 15 page guide. And it will tell you exactly. And it even has an email in there that I use copy and paste it into an email. And send that to organizers, and I I promise you that you will get booked to speak using this guide, guaranteed. So get booked to speak. So it's right there on the homepage, uh, the success core doc. Very cool. Well, um, man, I, I forgot to ask. So you were talking about South Carolina, but you're in Utah now, right? I am. Yeah, I retired, and I retired out of North Carolina and oh, moved to gotcha. Utah. Got you, got you. And now, in a couple months, I'll be moving back to Michigan, and that is where I will be forever. All right. Going back home. Sounds good. Nothing beats home. No. All right, man. Well, Sean Douglas, thesuccesscore.com, man. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast. It's been great. Appreciate you having me. All right, man. Have a good night. You too. So get booked to speak. All right. Um, I'm looking at his website now, and then uh, he's got a link to, he's got a Facebook group. Uh, so dive in, um, get out there. It, it's, um, it's cool when you speak. It's a great way to network. It's a great way to get more business. Obviously, when you get paid, you're getting business. But when you're up there in the front, you're the expert, and you get more business. So um, learn to speak more, okay? Get the word out. Get out in front of people. Uh, you will never regret speaking more uh, and certainly being paid to speak more uh, to share your words of wisdom. I'm, I'm focusing on that right now. Um, so if you know of someone, if you have an event, um, if you have a team, uh, if you're part of an association, uh, if you just know of a conference that I'd be a good fit for, please let me know. Okay, spread the word. And uh, if you know where Sergeant French is, 
from 1989, 90 at Lackland Air Force Base. Tell her Cadet Schaefer's looking for her. All right. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.